Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I, I'm a little unique in this crowd, I guess, because I represent a startup company and uh, will be four years old just next month. But uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm uh, one of the founders as well as the chief scientist at Ecovative Design. And Ecovative is a revolutionary new biomaterials company. And we're really challenging the paradigm today on how materials are both manufactured and used. So today I'm going to describe how we at Ecovative have looked to nature to develop the next generation of high performance, low cost materials. And how both the public and private sector really came together to help foster our social and environmental venture. Now our technology started about four years ago with an observation. And that observation was that this stuff is literally everywhere. Sometimes you see it discarded on the side of the road, in small piles, other times you find it in really large piles. Uh, it's known as expanded polystyrene, but you're probably more familiar with its trade name, a styrofoam. What you might not be as familiar with, however, is the high embodied energy within this material. You see a single cubic foot of expanded polystyrene has the same energy content as a liter and a half of petroleum. Now styrene, which is the precursor to expanded polystyrene, is not derived from petroleum. It's derived from natural gas. And we think that natural gas is better suited for applications such as heating our homes and fueling our cars, not for uses of materials, which are used for maybe months at a time and then discarded and left in a landfill for centuries. And expanded polystyrene is really ubiquitous. If you look at its applications, it's literally found everywhere, from construction materials to structural cores, items such as uh, furniture to lightweight vehicle panels, wind turbine blades, even surfboards for those of you who love the ocean. And of course, what we consider the most egregious uses are short-term non-durable applications, things such as cups and plates, you use them for maybe minutes at a time and then discard them. And of course, what we're focused on at Ecovative today are protective packaging applications. Now, if you look, most people think these materials are out of sight, out of mind once they're discarded. But a survey that was conducted by the US EPA in 2003 found that these materials have become a real burden to municipalities. Because up to 20% of landfill volumes, remember these materials are really low density, so they don't weigh much, but by volume, they can account for up to 20% of the landfill. And with landfill capping, that means we're looking for new land to allocate to new landfill space, which becomes quite a strain. So at Ecovative, we really see this as an opportunity because expanded polystyrene within the United States alone is an $8 billion industry. And if you look at it worldwide, it actually approaches $20 billion annually. And if we break out into looking at these different market segments, what you'll see is some of the ones that I mentioned earlier, the things such as structural cores for automotive components, for example, or construction materials. Expanded polystyrene is a great insulation, for example. But protective packaging is a really large market segment. That means that there's lots of protective packaging being produced every year. And expanded polystyrene is just one small portion of this. There's other expanded foams, like urethanes and polypropylenes, for example, all of which are in incredibly environmentally burdensome. And that's why at Ecovative, we've decided that we need better materials. And while we were developing our material platform, we have created three governing principles. And these principles have allowed us to ensure that we have met both the social and the environmental and the economic initiatives that we have set forth for our company. First and foremost, we're focused on using an open loop feedstock system. One of the primary issues with, you, with using fossil fuels as your raw materials is that it's prone to price volatility or price fluctuations, which is precisely what we saw in 2008. The price of expanded polystyrene more than doubled in just three months, and they tacked on a shipping charge associated with shipping these materials as well, because it doesn't make sense to ship lightweight materials long distances. At Ecovative, we're using domestic agricultural and industrial waste streams. We take other people's garbage, and using a biological process, we turn it, turn it into a higher value product. Now these materials that we use as our raw materials have no value. You can't burn them typically for energy because they have a high silica content, for example, and they have no nutritional value whatsoever for animals. Our second focus is that we have to use far less energy while emitting far less carbon dioxide. As you'll see later in my presentation, our materials today are literally grown, kind of like a tree, but our materials are grown in just five days. And they're grown in the dark, at room temperature, with very little human interaction. And I'm very pleased to say that today, our materials require a tenth of the embodied energy while emitting an eighth of the carbon dioxide 
of an equivalent volume of expanded polystyrene. And finally, what we consider to be the most important aspect is that all of our materials have to fit into nature's recycling system. Once we're complete with the use of our material, if it's a protective packaging part or a construction material, for example, these materials should passively return to the earth and serve as an active soil amendment. They should not last in landfills for centuries. And this is what really brought us to mushrooms. You see, mushrooms are nature's recyclers. They take the leaf litter that's produced every year, as well as the coarse woody debris, and since they're decomposers by nature, they break these materials down every year, converting it both into their own tissue or cellular structure, but also returning trace nutrients, things like nitrogen and potassium, back to the soil, where microflora and fauna can take advantage of these, and it's truly fostering the development of the ecosystem. Now, what you don't typically see, however, when you do see a mushroom either growing out of the ground or out of the tree in this situation, is what's known as the fungal mycelium. See, mycelium is fairly analogous to the root structure of a plant, but it's the root structure of the mushroom. And in this instance, the mycelium is what's gluing that mushroom to the tree. It's a number of little filamentous hairs that search through the soil, breaking down that leaf litter, as I mentioned before, and returning it to the soil. And one of the interesting things about mycelium is that it actually represents one of the largest organisms on Earth. But people don't really realize that. One network of fungal mycelium has been found in the American Northwest and literally covers hectares of land. It has more mass than a blue whale. And what's really interesting about this material is how strong it is. You see, if you take a piece of wood, for example, wood has a grain. If you bend that wood in one direction, it might be really strong. But if you bend it with the grain, it's more prone to rupture. The mycelium is kind of amorphous in its structure, meaning that it has the same strength in all linear directions. So you don't have to worry about loading it in different ways and having it fail. The other interesting aspect, if you look at the composition of it, the same biopolymer that makes up lobster and crab shells, chitin, makes up the fungal mycelium. So not only does this mean that it's really tenacious and durable, but it also means that it's waterproof. It's actually a class one vapor retarder. It's pretty hard to get this material wet. And finally, of course, since we do use fungal mycelium, oh, there are no spores in our materials, which means that there are no allergen concerns associated with this technology. In our process today, we have four primary steps. We have our raw materials, which as I mentioned before, are all waste. We take other people's garbage and convert it into a higher value product. Things such as agricultural byproducts or industrial uh, waste that we source within 500 miles of our manufacturing facilities, which today are located in upstate New York. Our second step is we put it into a tool. This tool gives it an environment for growth as well as gives the, the material the form in which we're looking to achieve with the final product. The third step is the growth process, where our organism literally self-assembles the product for us. While we go home every night and go to sleep, our fungus is still working hard to assemble our products for us. And our final process is the drying and shipping process, where we basically inactivate the fungus and make sure that it's never going to grow again. We do ship internationally, so this is a very crucial step.